We are starting live today. I recognize we are going to have a number of people joining us as always. I'm, I'm so excited to be with you and starting this serious discussion of section 109 of the, of the Doctrine and Covenants, as well as President Nelson's rejoice in the gift of priesthood keys today. As, as you are joining, you know, you all, I always love to hear where you're joining from. I think we all like to hear where you're joining from. So please, please help us and, and, and show us where you are so that we feel like we're joining together as a wonderful family and group of friends here. Oh, thank you. Love your hair. I did get a haircut. Thank you. It was so kind. Okay. Um, there, there is so much to cover. And hi, friend Lita. Texas. I, I just love seeing where you're from. Good morning. I will tell you as we're waiting for Elaine to get on. Curitiba. Hello, my friends in Brazil. I'm so excited for your new another new temple in Brazil. I need to know how many there are in Brazil. Richfield, North Carolina, Florida. Oh, this is so great. American Fork. Another Curitiba. So fun. Mesa, Logan, Providence area, Murray. Scattering inspiration. What a great name. And Elaine Dalton. Elaine, it says that you are waving to me. That's good. Virginia, Toronto, North Ogden. Norway. Hello to Norway. What time is it in Norway? I don't even know. San Antonio, Texas, North Carolina. Lipstick is on point today. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It is a different one. <laughs> I couldn't. I didn't have time to run down to, go to my car and grab the other one. Boise, Idaho, Western Oregon. Ozark, Alabama, Denver, Colorado, North Salt Lake, Syracuse, Utah. Oh my goodness, this is so fun. Hurricane, Utah. I hope I said that right for everybody in Hurricane. I used to teach out there at, in, in uh, Cyprus, the elementary school, 5 p.m. in Norway. Well, I'm glad it's not too late. Hello, Natal, Fern. It's good to have you. Newport Beach, California or Oregon? I'm assuming California, but there is a Newport Beach in Oregon, where, close to where I'm from. Hiram, Utah, Cash Valley. We were up in Bear Lake and Logan this last week taking pictures and having a good time. Um, Houston, Texas, walking. Oh, Elaine. California. Uh, yes, 510 in the Netherlands. Thank you. More from California. We're, we are just joining. Thank you, everyone, for joining. So Heber City, what a great area. Hello, my friend Elaine. Good morning. How are you? Oh, so great. Let's Look at this, Castle Rock, North Ogden. Elaine, it's so good to see you this morning. El Elaine, I have to tell you something. It's a little bit embarrassing. And to everyone else that's listening, this is, this is the reality of why this starts today at 8 or 9.03. I went on a walk this morning while my girls were swimming outside. I took the dog. Thanks to you, I'm, I'm walking. I'm getting that adrenaline, everything else going. And I listened to President Nelson's talk. I think I listened to it four times maybe five times. And then I started listening to section 109. At, at eight o'clock, I realized that I had completely lost myself in thought and I was a half an hour away from where the girls were swimming. <laughs> I just totally, I just kept walking Elaine. So I got the girls right before school started, picked them up, dropped them off at school and booked myself back here as fast as I possibly could. So today, because of President Nelson and section 109 and you, I will, I, and, and my own craziness, I completely got lost in my thoughts and was late picking up my girls from swim team and taking them to school. So there's our beginning of the day today. So just, so well, that's a real positive because I do that too. And it keeps me out there walking a little bit extra time. And that never hurts. No. That never helps, does it? I need to do that it more often, hurts. friend. The, the sad part was I actually didn't know where I was. So I actually had to get my map out. <laughs> Yeah, how to get back to the rec center. It was a little bit embarrassing, but here we are. Here we are, Elaine. Next time, come with me. I'm sure I won't get lost if you're with me. Anyway. <laughs> it's a good thing. Hello, everyone. To do. It's a good thing to do. There's something about walking and listening to the conference talks that make them go in you in a different way. So, everyone, I, I highly recommend that. I really, and, and you know, Elaine and I keep saying this. We are going to make, make a date where we're going to go on a walk together with everyone. You can just join us and walk and talk as we walk along. We... There, there is no, I, I love walking and listening to general conference talks. And that is for me, if I'm going to keep walking forever, you turn on general conference and you, I mean, you could go for hours. Yeah. If my body could keep up with my mind sometimes I've got to, I've got to work on the body part more. So thank you, Elaine. So great. <laughs> Elaine, what do you think? Where should we go start? Oh, you know, now, Barb, I'm just breathless. I'm breathless with, uh, with what we've just heard and experienced at general conference. And I, uh, I, I, I mean, I don't have, I don't have words for, for what we're a part of. And I think it's just so, 
exciting, but I, I'm very excited to begin with, um, with, the, with the prophet's talk, of course. And, and then DNC 109 is, is big. And I, I had a friend who said, oh, I went home after conference and I immediately read all of DNC 109, so I'm done. <laughs> She's not done. We're gonna take, I think I'd like to take my time on that and talk about that with everyone. Um, but I also don't want to drop the, the idea that we're reading these talks looking for doctrines, principles, and applications. So those are my thoughts. Elaine, I, I, I can't agree more. So one of my concerns, to be honest, I, I like to, I like to, I mean, I just like to study and do everything. And I recognize sometimes because I do that, I, I have a hard time focusing on what's right in front of me. So this is, this is my suggestion. Elaine and I are going to work to come up with the perfect, not the perfect, but a good schedule that we're going to use for the next six months for everyone. I, I, which we did last time. Last time we were, we, we just did it in order of prophets teachings and just went right through from October general conference. This time in our, in our two minute discussion before we got on there, we were talking about how we feel like we are going to, change things up a little bit and maybe do it a little bit more thematically and and we'll get back to you on that one but i will put a an instagram sketch i'll put a schedule on my instagram of these prophetic talks elaine will have one too and also anybody we we have a newsletter so if you want these talks which we're just starting a newsletter because we realize there's more that we can ever say in a conversation on monday mornings at nine o'clock but as you can see these talks have all been i'm just going to show you I'll, I'll start with president President Holland, and I recognize this is backwards, but you can see that they have these lines on the side and then they're all numbered. This goes through the schedule that Elaine and I are doing. Elaine, did you get one on Saturday? Yes, I did. Okay, good. Yeah. Just have to make sure. So these are the lines, they're numbered, and then you can also see that there is typically space after the talks for you to continue to write notes and things. And this is just your doctrines, principles, invitations, and promised blessings. It's a free PDF download that you can just, if you just go to my little Instagram page and you go, there's a little bubble, they're called highlight bubbles, the things that you learn. If you go to that, click on it, it'll take you to the Shopify, I guess it's what it's called. And that, if you put your information there and there's a little place for your email, that means you'll be put on the, the newsletter <laughs> list and then we will send you, you'll all automatically get the PDF of everything just for free on there. But then you'll also have a newsletter that'll give you future information that you need if you want to be a part of just kind of following through and making sure that you're on top of what's going on. So we'll put the schedule on that newsletter, but we'll also put the schedule on my Instagram account and we'll see if we can get somehow to do it on your Instagram account, Elaine, for now. Okay. So people can just go right to it and they can, we can see exactly where we are on that schedule. That was probably more explaining than most of you needed. Most of you understand this better than I do, but Elaine and I are figuring this out still. So, but we want to make sure everyone can do their homework so that we're all prepared and have these really good discussions beforehand. I'm, I'm a firm believer that when we are prepared and have read even beforehand, we can get deeper into the conversation and really focus on what's most important here. And we all, we, Elaine and I love your comments. As you know, you, all of you are a big part of this conversation as you're writing comments in the actual, in the, in the feed that goes through. And somebody last time was helping us keep track of those comments. So we're going to keep trying that as well. Um, Somebody says print double sided. I forgot. Oh yes, print double sided, because it's we have our wonderful friend Lori who has just done this, put this together, and it's meant for a three ring binder. If you want to do it that way, um, also there's there's a place down here. In, in, so I live in Lehigh. There's a place in Lehigh called Pioneer Party that I talked to them because I had so many people ask me if I could do a printout, and they they said that they'd be willing to just just sell these for us at cost at their shop. So. They, they may charge a buck or two to put them on their shelves. I don't actually know how that works yet, but we're just going to drop them off there and just let people go and buy it if you want it already just printed. Because I know some people, it's hard to print it off your own printers and it's kind of a pain. So yeah, Pioneer Party, they are great. Okay, yes. So anyway, I will, after this discussion today, I'll make some copies, run over there and drop some off for anybody who wants, <laughs> anybody who wants those. That'll be my, my, I won't walk this time though. I'll drive. Okay, enough of that administrative. Is that okay, Elaine? I think that's perfect. Okay. Perfect. Elaine, I want to jump into this really. So it's, we're doing the, the talk, Rejoice in the Gift of the Priesthood Keys. And we're going to be talking about this talk for the next six months 
amongst everything else. You, you can't, this talk, you can't just do it once and then be done. I think there's so many principles and doctrines and things in here and teachings that I think we're going to have to keep referring back to it in context of the other talks too. But I just wanted to start off. I, I think this is fascinating. And I don't know if I have this story exactly right. I didn't have time this morning to look at it. But Elaine, you probably know more than I do. On that paragraph number one, when President Nelson starts out, he talks about how it's um, the 40 year anniversary, April 7th, 1984, when President Nelson and President oh. Oaks were called as members of the Quorum of the Twelve. I find this story extremely fascinating because President Kimball was the prophet at that time and he was actually not doing well. He was in the hospital and he, you can actually find this story in President Nelson's biography and maybe President Oaks, I'm not sure, I'd have to look. But, but he was not doing well at the time and um, the word was given that as soon as, as, when President Nelson was, I mean, President Oaks was, oh my goodness, when President Kimball was doing well, that he was to contact the other members of the first presidency or leaders of the Quorum of the Twelve. When when he was doing well, they did call and they asked him about the next two members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And he said, it should be Russell M. Nelson and Dallin H. Oaks in that order. And, and I just find that so fascinating that here it's still the prophet. He is the one who holds priesthood keys. And in this case, as President Nelson talked about, the keys of presiding. And it was on him to be calling the next two members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. You can find that, we're not gonna take time to go into this right now, but the Doctrine and Covenants is very clear that it's going from president, that the next president of the church will be called by a president of, of, of the church. So that, that situation and that order of succession in the church has followed since the days of Joseph Smith to Brigham Young when he gave priesthood keys. Not, not, not to go into too much of this detail right now, but since I got started, I can't stop myself. Keep going, keep <laughs> this priest going. Okay, these priesthood keys become important. And we talked about this community of Christ church, which is the second largest church, church of the break off of this early church. But what was so important, and I just want to throw this out for everyone. One of the critical reasons, besides, besides the fact that many, we have many testimonies of seeing Brigham Young and taking upon himself the voice and sometimes even the lisp of Joseph Smith and the spirit confirming the truth of, of Brigham Young becoming the next leader of this church during that time right after Joseph Smith died. So that's June 27th, 1844, he passes away. And then they need to know who the next prophet is, next leader of the church is. We have to understand, and this goes to President Nelson's talk, Brigham Young and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles had received these keys, not just the keys of, of presidency, and I don't wanna minimize this, but this is important that we understand both, and he talks about both. They received the keys of presidency already. Joseph Smith had given to them and said, now you have these keys and can direct this church. So we had the Melchizedek priesthood by Peter, James, and John. And he also had the Aaronic priesthood, of course, by, by, by John, John the Baptist. But significantly, these keys were also the keys of, that were received in the Kirtland Temple. So the keys of the gathering, the keys of sealing, the keys of the Gospel of Abraham were also given to the first presidency in Quorum of the Twelve. So only those men who had stayed true to Joseph Smith and who were members of the Quorum of the Twelve at that time, with Brigham Young being head of the Quorum of the Twelve, had those keys. And those keys are only had, only, by the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve. There's no other person. They have delegated keys, but they don't have those keys that were given in, Kirtland, in the Kirtland Temple. So literally, the only person on the earth who could have been the next prophet was Brigham Young. As the member, as the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles at that time, and so then he goes in, which is why it's important today that we understand. Dallin H. Oaks is the president of the Quorum of the Twelve, with with President Jeffrey R. Holland acting in his position as the acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve, and and so that's that's important. From succession, it would then be during time President Oaks would be the next prophet. He is the one in charge of those keys. The other men have the keys, but it's the one who was the next succession who is the director of all those keys on the earth at that time. Anyway, that is that is a long explanation, but to me, it's absolutely critical that we understand that Brigham Young had to be the next prophet because he was the leader of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He was the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and he had all of the keys that had been given on the earth through Jesus Christ. One more point that I'll stop with today, Elaine, and I'm turning it over to you because I know I'm blasting my mouth, but I love this topic so much. The other one is to remember, as we're looking at the doctrine of this talk, and there, 
there are a few that we could talk about, but for me, the most important topic, the most important doctrine would be surrounding the Godhead and the atonement of Jesus Christ, because these keys are Christ's keys. He is the leader of this church. He is the prof. He, he is the head of this church. This is his church and all keys belong to him. And so we're talking about the prophet on the earth has these keys. These are the keys of Jesus. These are Christ's keys. And he has given the president of the church the authority to, to use all of these keys and be in charge of all these keys. Again, all members of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve have these keys under the direction of President Nelson, who is under the direction of Jesus Christ, the head of this church. Okay, I have blasted my mouth, Elaine. I, I have to say, everyone, that was the most concise, clear, correct, description of some things that happened in church, church history because the the keys to, to the presidency were given on the banks of the Susquehanna, right. correct? That's right. Uh, right. Before, well, and, and that meant that Joseph Smith could organize the church. Right. But then they had to build a temple and, and we'll learn about that in DNC 109. So the Lord could, could manifest himself or, or restore those other keys. Is that correct, Barb? That's right. You know, I think we talked about that a little bit last time, but just, just, just as a reminder, the church could not be established on the earth in 1830 unless the keys of the priesthood, the, the presiding keys of priesthood were restored. And those presiding keys belong to the first presidency and quorum of the 12, but the presiding keys are also what we would say a mission president has, a state president have, the presidency of the 70 have those keys. These are keys of presiding and those keys allow them to preside over their quorums. And in the case of the first presidency quorum at 12, over the church, right? The, the deacon's quorum president has keys for the deacon's quorum. Just a reminder, he doesn't have keys for the prime, he doesn't have keys for the young women because his keys are for his quorum, not for the young women. The, the teacher's quorum president, the bishop has these keys, right? He has the keys and he is the president of the priest quorum. But those keys are not the same keys. Those are presiding keys. Those keys are not the same keys that we're talking about. And that's why President Nelson says these keys were conferred, these next keys, these keys are conferred in the Kirtland Temple. And we'll go, we'll, we'll go there and talk about that. But that's why 1830, we were able to establish the church, but it's not until 1836, it's not until 1836 that the, that the Kirtland Temple is actually dedicated because they had to do it after they, in the process of, and that's why you see 109 and 110 together, receiving these keys. So now they have the keys of the temple. These are the early keys that Adam and Eve that we're talking about when they enter into the patriarchal order of the priesthood. This is temple. This is, this is Abraham and Sarah. This is Moses. These are the keys that were lost. We, I know I can confuse a lot of people by talking about this. There's a, there's a, you know what? Not to, not that I'm trying to promote my book. I don't even know where the book is that I wrote, but I wrote a chapter almost on priest of keys. I'm seeing people asking different questions about keys that actually I gave you a, a chart in there that talks about the various keys of the priesthood. In fact, there are over 40 different kinds of keys talked about in, in the scriptures. The keys that we most commonly talk about are the keys of presiding. And now we're also very much talking about these keys of sealing, gathering of Israel and the keys of the gospel of Abraham. We, we'll we'll talk about that more going forward. We have we have every Monday morning at nine to continue this to continue this conversation. I guess also for those of you who want to join on May third, for those who want to have a little bit more in depth conversation since I got started on this, following women's conference at the Provo Rec Center, I am going to be holding a a discussion where I can go through and really talk about the priesthood keys of the gospel of Jesus Christ in context, especially of women and priesthood. So. There'll be something posted eventually on here. I've had so many people requesting that, but I'm just going to hold a two hour gathering and we can just go through priesthood and priesthood keys and much of this. And maybe we'll learn something and maybe we can talk more even face to face or do some Zoom meetings, focus more on priesthood and women. So anyway. Okay. And, and also, also wow. I would just recommend um, reading Doctrine and Covenants 107 oh. and just and just uh, identifying there, just go, go slowly through Doctrine and Covenants 107. That'll help you a lot because I, I don't think as women we, we think about priesthood keys uh, as much as, as maybe the men do, but keys are huge. And I just remember uh, visiting that beautiful little chapel in Denmark where the Torvalsons Christus is, and they have the and they have the 12 apostles in marble along the sides. And, and the story that was told by when President Kimball visited there, 
And yeah. he said, and he said, he pointed to the keys that P Peter's carved out of marble, holding keys in his hand, a big thing of keys. And he pointed to those keys and said, those are the keys of the priesthood of God. And those are the keys I hold. Yep. But Peter anciently also held those. And I thought it was really remarkable that who that Torvalson carved those keys, had that kind of understanding, just saying, this man had the keys. He was the president of the church, prophet of the church. Yeah, uh, Elaine, and that's, again, if we're looking at the historical part of this, we have we have those early priesthood keys, and you're talking about through Peter. So then if we start again, Peter has the keys of presiding that he was given through Jesus Christ himself. And then on the on the Mount of Transfiguration, and this is why it's so critical that we understand the history and we understand Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and, our, and then our living prophets today. It's on the Mount of Transfiguration that those keys, again, these keys that we're talking about, patriarchal order of the priesthood, that's why Elias comes, Elijah comes, Moses comes. They're giving these keys, and these are the keys, again, of sealing. And th these are the keys of the, the gathering of Israel and the, and the keys of Abraham, which is why after the apostasy, the apostasy, during the apostasy, we've lost those keys on the, on the earth. And, and that is why in the restoration, we need to receive those keys of presiding again, right off the bat. And then we receive again, those keys in the Kirtland temple, which is what we get, we jump into this talk. I want to get into this talk because this is what president Nelson's explaining. We needed these keys in the Kirtland temple. And it's a beautiful understanding here. He, he, I just love that he starts talking about the Kirtland temple and how we have, and he says here very clearly in verse four, through mutual beneficial discussions. To me, this may sound like um, maybe not a big deal. It's a big deal. It has been, what, the church left Kirtland in 1837. It has been almost 200 years since, since the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has really owned this church and owned this temple. I appreciate over the years I've gone to the Kirtland Temple many, many times, and I have absolutely loved the chances that I've had to go through this temple and have members of the Community of Christ Church take us through. But what a blessing it is today that through mutually beneficial discussions, and, and I, I want to point this out, President Nelson is a peacemaker, and through mutually beneficial discussions, I have had personal conversations with members of the Community of Christ, Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, direct descendants of President Joseph, Joseph Smith, on discussions regarding this mutual beneficial discussion, mutual beneficial, beneficial discussion, which they had. And it is true. These are mutually beneficial um, discussions that the selling of the Kirtland Temple is both beautiful for us and for members of the community of Christ Church. It is a win-win. There, there, of course, it's going to be a difficult. There's going to be some difficulty in some for, for passing this temple to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But I really hope going forward as members of the church, we're grateful for the work that they have done and also for a prophet who was able to have these conversations and members, other people who are involved in, in making this process seem so seamless with us. I, I'm, on a, I'm on a dialogue group with members of the Community of Christ Church. I've been doing it for over 10 years and we are very, very, very good friends. So I, I love that we now have this temple and I love that it's a, it's, a, it's a friendship. And I hope that members of the Community of Christ know that they are welcome to our, to the, to, to God's, temple just as they welcomed us to theirs so i'm just throwing that out these are wonderful 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 friends of the church and i'm grateful that we are now able to enter this temple and that we can do what we need to do with it under the direction of god jesus christ through his prophet man elaine i'm blasting my amen. mouth so much amen today. <laughs> amen let's just keep going here through this talk uh but one one question that president nelson asked that maybe we should keep on our minds as we go through this talk um, we'll talk about these keys some more, and we'll also talk about his invitations. And I want to preface this. A prophet, the prophet never challenges us. Uh, he doesn't say, I, I challenge. Uh, they will always say, I invite. And that's what the, the Savior would do as well. I invite. There's no confrontational kind of word. So remember that he is inviting us to do these things. And we can then, again, it's a respect for our agency, I think. But on uh, paragraph number 16, I keep this in mind as we go through. Consider how your life would be different if priesthood keys had not been restored to the earth. I think that's a oh. very good question to be thinking about as we read this and go through the talk. 
Amen, Elaine. So, yeah, I, I, I appreciate you saying that, you know, somebody has read that section 109 once. I don't want to be negative or derogatory at all. I don't know how many times I've read section 109. I still don't get it completely. And I learned a ton this morning on my walk, which is partially why I got lost. <laughs> like I just got so, so stuck in learning and learning and being reminded. I, I'm gonna give you an example. So Elaine, Elaine, you mentioned going to section 107. So I, in, in, all, in all, just trying to teach an important principle, I'm just gonna teach this. Section 107 starts, it's 1835. So the temple has now been dedicated, right? And I, I want to show, maybe just look at how important it is to understand section 109. There are in the, in the church, sorry, this is April 1835. I completely just confused you on that. I was thinking section 84, and then I went to 107 and 109. My bad. This is 107. This is right before section 109. But listen to these, just the first three verses. There are in the church two priestess, namely the Melchizedek and Aaronic, including the Levitical priesthood. So the Levitical is tied into that. Verse two, why the first is called the Melchizedek priesthood is because Melchizedek was such a great high priest. Verse three, before his day, it was called the holy priesthood after the order of the son of God. That is a very sacred name. And so I'm gonna throw this out to you, to, to all of us. The highest order of the Melchizedek priesthood, the priesthood after the order of the son of God, was lost during the time of Moses. In section 84, it teaches us that very clearly. It was brought in again during the time of Joseph Smith, but the priesthood after the holy, after the order of the Son of God is the highest order of the Melchizedek priesthood entered into when a man and a woman are sealed together in the temple following the, the endowment and the initiatory. We enter the holy order after the Son of God as men and women. Women enter that order. That's the patriarchal order. When President Nelson talks the fullness of the priesthood, the patriarchal order and the priesthood after the order of the Son of God, that is very sacred. That is, we are then on the right road to becoming priests and priestesses, kings and queens. It's not just, I don't want to minimize by saying, I, I do minimize by using that word, but when the young men are, are deacons at the age of 11, they are entering into and being ordained to the office of priesthood, but entering into the holy order after the Son of God is temple. And so, this is sacred. Once we start understanding temple better, we start seeing that section 84 and section 107 and section 109, especially women, he's speaking to us. Too often we have taught these sections as if we are speaking to men who are being ordained to a priesthood office. These are for all women and men who have received priesthood endowments, who wear the, 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 the garment of the holy priesthood and who have made and kept sacred covenants in the temple. I, I cannot emphasize, and I, I could get emotional about this, I cannot emphasize the importance of the temple recommend questions and our commitment to follow Jesus Christ and take upon us his name and put upon us his name. We want to enter into the holy order after the son of God. We wanted that premortally. Nothing, I can't imagine, I can't imagine the promises that must have been made to us premortally to get me to leave everyone and be willing to leave my family, especially heavenly parents, my brothers and sisters, all of you who I'm confident I love dearly before I left the pre-mortal world and come to this earth. There must have been very, very good promises because by nature, I'm a homesick person and I love to be with people. And I, I, my capacity to love is probably bigger than it ever should be, but I promise you, I, wouldn't, I would not have committed to leaving everybody I loved unless there was a very high commitment from Jesus Christ himself to make sure I was with everyone again and the promises must have been, it'll be better then than it is now. So I, I just simply testify, this is powerful. These keys make it so that we could receive all that our Heavenly Father promised us in the pre-mortal world possible only through our Savior, Jesus Christ. So I know I can totally get into this, but since we did, Elaine, can I go to verse six? Because yes. I love his description yes. of Christ here. And this comes from section 110 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Let me just, let me just say Please. one. Oh, Please. No, President Priesthood now. Yeah. Just so we don't repeat that sacred name after the order of the Son of God, right? It's so sacred that they named it the Melchizedek Priesthood because Melchizedek was a one, a, a perfect almost. Yes, right? this great high priest. After absolutely. Okay, so thank you, Elaine, and thank you everyone for just letting me blast my mouth sometimes. I I I love this more than I can even I can even get out. I, to me, this. <laughs> Uh, 
well, I, I don't even know how to go there. I, and I totally understand Barb's passion because once you study this and once the spirit teaches you individually, it's just absolutely astounding. And what it does for me is it says, Heavenly Father loves his children. God loves his children. He wants us back. He wants us to have this experience, but he wants us back. These are all just, this is just uh, evidence of how much he loves us. And, and all we, we, we just have to, we have to understand this. So we desire it more than anything else, I think. Amen, Elaine. And I'm, I'm going to answer one person's question because we don't have time to go into this. We'd have to have a, an entirely other class on section 84. But somebody just asked, when were the priesthood keys lost in Old Testament time? If you go to section 84 and look at verses 18 through 24, the Lord through his prophet Joseph Smith explains exactly when these were lost during the times of Moses. And then he teaches us that Elijah was given these keys of sealing. That's why Elijah is able to seal the heavens and the earth. That Elijah was given that specific responsibility over priesthood keys. And so everything that everything that Elaine just said is exactly right. And that's why Elijah becomes so important. And Moses becomes so important. Abraham and 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 Sarah. There is no Abrahamic covenant if there is no Sarah, because Abrahamic covenant, patriarchal order of the priesthood, is only bearable when men or women are equally yoked. That, that's a whole other topic. Sometimes we're negative about the patriarchal order. I hope we understand the patriarchal order of the priesthood means that a husband and a wife are equally yoked, understanding their, their eternal role as a wife and a husband and raising an eternal family forever. It's not, it's not a man over a woman. It's a man and a wife together working for the salvation of their children to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of God's children now and their own children in the future. It's powerful. If we could just spend more time, even in the, even in the Old Testament itself, you, you, wow, you guys really, you, you're getting me going here. But you think about why Vashti, <laughs> Esther, why does Esther have to go? Why does Esther have to, have to, risk her life? Because they've lost the patriarchal order of the priesthood. If they had the patriarchal priesthood order of the priesthood, we would never have needed that. Vashti wouldn't have been dancing in front of a bunch of men of the king. Why? Because amen to the priesthood and the and the authority thereof. Abraham's the not having we, we have to have the covenants. And we they have to have the yes. went down to get a, for Isaac to marry someone who was a covenant keeper. So yep. yeah. yeah. Yes. Amen, yeah. amen, 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 and amen. If we really understood the Old Testament of what it was teaching, the righteous people going into this order, there is a level of respect and love and understanding that is higher than anything that 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 the world would teach us today. So that's a discussion for another day too. We have we we could have tangents all day long on this. Can we keep going? Verse, I mean, paragraph number six. There's one that says, "Why was it not restored during Christ's life?" It was, and that's where I was just talking about. That's that's the ser that's the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, not the Sermon on the Mount. Holy cow! But that's the Mount of, Trans Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah. So look at the Mount of Trans Transfiguration, and you can you can exactly see that it was restored. That's that's what's so beautiful. The apostasy during the apostasy, we lost all of those keys. But that's, that's the sacred nature of the Mount of Transfiguration that sometimes we just read so quickly. It's right there. It, it is sacred. Okay, okay, so. Keep going. Number six. The most important of these events occurred on Saturday, on Easter Sunday, sorry, <laughs> I just made that up completely. <laughs> the most important of these events occurred on Easter Sunday, April 3rd, 1836. On that day, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery experienced a series of remarkable visitations. First, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared. The prophet recorded the Savior's eyes were as a flame of fire. The hair of his head was white like the pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun and his voice as the sound of the rushing of great waters. I mean, I can't, I, all that they had been through to get them to get to Kirtland and all that they had sacrificed to build that temple and Christ makes himself known. Like. And, huh. and, and I think Joseph Smith used the best vocabulary words, the best adjectives he could to describe the Savior, but probably words are not describable because I think fire, we don't, we don't, we, we see fire in his eyes, but I think it was just so bright that it yes. was, he didn't have anything else to, to put to that. So yeah, key, it, it's, it's so wonderful. So the first thing that happens is we find out what, what he appeared he looked like. And then the next thing 
that President Nelson teaches us is that Christ revealed his identity. And you all know, President Nelson keeps talking to us about our identity, who we are. And it is so important because just like Moses, Elijah, and Eliot, we all have a divine earthly mission to perform. And we have to know who we are. So anyway, I, that's just a little side road. But Barb, uh, it, it, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It, it, it's, it's amazing. Elaine, do you want to just read those next two verses? I really, next two paragraphs. I really wish all of you, we, I wish we were all in the classroom together so we could just take turns and listen to each other. But, but let's just, Elaine, if you don't mind just reading number seven and number eight, this during, description during that this, Joseph this, gives. During this visitation, the Lord affirmed his identity. He said, I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who was slain. I am your advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ then declared he had accepted the temple as his house and made this stunning promise. I will manifest myself to my people in mercy in this house. And I have to go to the next paragraph because paragraph nine says, President Nelson now speaks and says the significant, this significant promise applies to every, in italics, dedicated temple today. I invite, there's that invitation, I invite you to ponder what the Lord's promise means for you personally. First invitation, and what, a, what an invitation. Elaine, you look at that, you look at what he's saying there, when Christ, when Christ introduces himself, to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cadbury, and he says, I am your advocate with the Father. <laughs> we look at it at 2024, and we're used to having Christ as our advocate. And we're used, to, and maybe I, maybe I say this because I, maybe I take the church for granted too much. I was raised in the church. I was raised knowing that I could repent. I was raised knowing that I had a Father in heaven who loved me. I was raised with those things, and I maybe I took it for granted because I'd always known. This is the first time that we have a prophet on the earth in the temple receiving the understanding that Christ is the advocate with the Father, and indeed he is, and now they are able to make covenants in the Lord that they have not been able to make in a temple for 2,000, almost 2,000 years. Christ, as an advocate with the Father is making it possible for all of us to make and keep sacred covenants through the priesthood keys that Joseph Smith is going to restore so that we could have eternal families. He indeed is the advocate of the Father. That's with the Father. That is, that is not just a fun name. He is stating, I am here to save you. I, I am here to bring you these keys. I am here to make eternal life possible. The gathering of Israel, all the covenants of Abraham, and you can be sealed with your family for eternity. That, that was unknown. And I, I don't know that they even understood what Christ was saying at that time. I'm doubting it, but I don't know. I, Joseph Smith may have. I'm doubting Oliver Cowdery understood at that moment. Because they haven't even, they haven't received the blessings associated with, with the, the Nauvoo Temple yet. In the Nauvoo Temple time, they're going to learn even more about what it means to be sealed for eternity. But this, regardless, God knows, and he has introduced himself, Jesus Christ, as the advocate with the Father. So... And then to, to Elaine, your point on in, that invitation, I will manifest myself to my people in to my people in mercy in this house. Not just the Kirtland Temple, but every other temple on the earth, Christ will make himself known to people in because they're all his house. Could you imagine after all these years, Christ finally has a place to come? And not that he can't visit. I mean, obviously he he visited Joseph Smith in that sacred grove, but a place to call his holy house. I just Again, back to the homesickness, to, to, to build a house where everyone can come and recognize that this is the house of the Lord with, with the letters on it. This is, it's not oh. just my house, you know, Highland, Utah. This is the house of the Lord. His address is the house of the Lord. I just, it's And then you, you tie that to the end where he goes ahead and announces more temples. And he said when he was a boy, there were six temples. And here he is announcing more temples. Why? This is the why. This whole talk is the why. It is. And, and temples need to be all over the earth because God loves his children. He wants to give us every opportunity to return back into his presence. And the temple, 
President Nelson always taught the temple is the reason for everything we do. And some people could misunderstand that, but the, but Christ is at the heart of, of the temple. Yep. And when he says he's our advocate, he says, I employeth no servant there when, when we go back home. Because he wants to be there to greet us, to love us, to hug us, to say, good job. He, and be our advocate with the Father. So hey, Christ goodness. teaches us that there'll be no, I mean, that he will be there at the gate, basically, to, to, to be there. And sometimes we think of Christ being at the gate to greet us, and people don't understand. Elder Maxwell teaches very, very clearly, Christ isn't at the gate so that he can judge you and make you feel bad. He wants to be there to, to throw his arms around you. He wants to be at the gate for you. So, okay, um, number 10. Elaine, I think we could just do a couple more. And this is what we were talking about before, but now we're specifically referring to a section 110 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where when you really start in these verses, so Christ has come in those first view where he accepts, says this, and verse seven, I can't imagine how giddy Joseph and Oliver must have been when Christ says, I have accepted this house. Oh my goodness. I, I mean, the work that they had to put into that. And, and anybody who knows the church history and some of those plans that they were going to do before and they were going to build it out of wood and Joseph has to go back and say, no, that's not it. And that's not it. And I, I mean, these people had nothing and they're building this amazing house. And then finally Christ comes and says, I have accepted this house. And how many times he does so in mercy, he says. And then verse eight, I will appear unto my servants and speak unto them with mine own voice, which he just did, but he will continue to do, do so. We could talk more, but then you start getting into 11, and this is where we see these angelic visitations. And, and wasn't that incredible how President Nelson talked about, we need to know that angels are among us? Oh, yeah. I mean, President Holland. Uh, amen. I, I, think, that I too. think Elder Holland's and Elder, they're, they're really, he, Elder Holland was first, President Nelson was last. They're just bookends, and they just, they just go together, huh. study those two together. Yes. Pre to make this point, President Holland could not have given the talk that he gave if we did not have priest of keys on the earth. And then President Nelson just made sure we all understood that. And then everyone in between just kept fortifying. It was just so amazing. So verse, verse 10, following the Savior's visitation, Moses appeared. Moses conferred upon Joseph Smith the keys of the gathering of Israel and the return of the 10 tribes. Now, again, I would strongly suggest that you go back to section 84 and understand more of what Moses did and what he was doing. There's so much more. Just go to the Old Testament and we know Moses, right? We'll continue to study. But specifically, if you look at section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants, you can see Moses. And we've talked, I think we talked about that last week and his responsibility in the keys of the gathering of Israel. Then in verse 11, when this vision closed, so it's interesting that you have Christ and then you have Moses and the vision closed. It's not like you just see them all coming at the same time. There's a close to that vision. So then you go to verse 11. 11. When this vision closed, Elias appeared and committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham to Joseph. I get a lot of questions on this, and this is something that we're going to study and talk about more in the future, is what exactly is this gospel of Abraham, and who is this Elias? So we'll talk about that in much more detail. To be honest with a lot of this is stuff that we are, we are trying to understand this, and this is very much Latter-day Saint doctrine and information as we try to understand it from the perspective of the prophets and revelators in our day. So I'm throwing that out. And then verse 12, and I'm going to shut my mouth, Elaine, and then you're up no. again. No. Then Elijah, the prophet, appeared. I mean, I, I want to meet Elijah so bad. I do. There, there, there are a number of prophets and things that I want to meet. But Elijah, I mean, what kind of prophet goes up to a woman and tells him to feed him, tells her to feed him, and then what? I mean, who does that? But he has so much faith. And I just think, I can't imagine the kind of love he must have asked he must have had when he asked that woman to make the, the widow of Zarephath to make him a, a you know, a bread, a, give him, give him the, the oil and the, and the flour. I, but he knew God so well that he could make the promise because he had the ceiling keys and he could do that. And he understood he had proved himself to the Lord. The Lord gave him that promise. But I, when he sees that woman put the widow of Zarephath, put that her hand back in there and she has enough food for herself and her son. I mean, I, I want to know how he felt. I, I mean, I would observe that. I, I think I can feel a little bit of how she must have felt. Not really. But do Elijah be like, told you. I mean, I just, just love it. Anyway, sorry for that again. Okay. So no, his it, appearance. It, full it's so great, Barb. Just keep okay. talking because, yeah, yeah. It was faith on, on, on the widow's part, too. But the Lord, the Lord asks us to do hard things sometimes because he wants to bless us, maybe. Yes. So anyway. 
Yes. Keep going. It's not like you just wake up one morning and you're the prophet. Elijah had to prove himself to the Lord. Elijah had to be obedient. And that kind of a level of obedience, when the Lord gives you the keys of sealing on the earth, that you see that in Helaman chapter 10 as well, those sealing keys. To me, that is, that's a, that is, you have received God's trust. Okay. His appearance fulfilled Malachi's promise that before the second coming, the Lord would send Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. Elijah conferred the keys of the sealing power upon Joseph Smith. So you can see the end of Malachi talks about this. And then section two of the Doctrine and Covenants, right off the bat, the first section that is actually received and written in the Doctrine and Covenants has this exact promise. Section two is another section. It wouldn't surprise me at all if President Nelson just said, now next time study section two of the Doctrine and Covenants. There are only a couple of verses, but these go hand in hand because this is Elijah. So section two of the Doctrine and Covenants absolutely ties into section 109 and section 110. These promises are here being fulfilled. Somebody just said, where are we? We are studying President Nelson's talk, <laughs> General Conference, that rejoice in the gift of priesthood keys. We are on now, we just read paragraph 12. Clearly we're gonna have a hard time getting through this talk. Elaine, I'm oh, gonna be quiet oh, for a we second. Might have, we might have to have it to be continued because the invitations are so huge, but can I just go on with the, what he states after he tells us, uh, re teaches us again, the role of Moses, Elijah, and Elias. He says, the significance of these keys being returned to the earth by three heavenly messengers under the direction of the Lord cannot be overstated. Wow, wow. It can't be. Section two, section two of the doctrine, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna show you one reason why this can't be overstated. We talked about section two. Now, now listen, listen. he says, Section two, Doctrine and Covenant section two. Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So Joseph knew this was going to happen. The date of this is 1823. This was before the church was restored. Before the church was restored, the Lord had already promised through the, through, through the prophet angel Moroni that Joseph Smith was going to receive this visitation from Elijah. So when, when Peter, James, and John come, and John the Baptist come, I, if I were him, I'd be saying, okay, but you promised Elijah, right? Elijah doesn't come for another decade and a half. And so Joseph knows that there's something missing and somewhere in the future, even at that point, I wish I had every day of Joseph Smith's thoughts so that I knew exactly when he knew what, but we don't. But then you go into verse two. He shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to the fathers. Now. To your point in verse in, in number 13, Elaine, the significance of these keys being returned to the earth by three heavenly messengers under the direction of the Lord cannot be over, overstated. You go to verse three and listen to what he says. If these keys had not, if Elijah had not come, this is what would happen. If it were not so, it says in verse three, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. I mean, there's, there's no purpose of even being here. The whole earth would be utterly wasted if it were not for the, if it were not for the keys revealed and restored, conferred upon these men. It's, it's, so, it's so powerful. I and mean, I just have to get in my little plug for walking. When you're out there walking and listening and you're still, you will be taught very powerfully by the, by the Holy Ghost. Uh, the Lord wants us to really get this in us and understand. And I am amazed uh, when, when I'm still and uh, prayerful and, and listening to the prophetic words, uh, what, what is taught to me by, just by the Holy Ghost. And that's powerful teaching. And I think that's how Barbara's learned a lot of these things. And she's taken the time. It takes time. It ta it's, are you willing to do the spiritual work? She's been willing to do the spiritual work that it takes to understand these things. But also, I'm so grateful for her weaving these things together for us so we can see how amazing the Father's plan was and is for us. And, and the, how amazing it is that we're here on the earth right now. So, Barb, thank you so much for just weaving in Doctrine and Covenants section two. Well, I might put that together. I mean, I, I would have, but you know, we study in little increments. And so I love the, the big picture. Well, you know, just 
let's wait till Doctrine and Covenant's year next year and we are gonna have a stinking riot together. Because the reality is this ties into this ties into the Book of Mormon as well. I mean, we're it's so hard to do this and out because we we're looking at we're looking at how many times is the word covenant mentioned in the Book of Mormon? It's the same thing. It's oh, yeah. I'm not weaving it together. God is, you know, like, I, mean, I appreciate the Adelaide, but the reality is it, God has weaved it together. If we just continue to study the scriptures, all of a sudden we're like, what in the, God has made this plan so clear. Uh, I just, I really want to make this, this point. And I, I, I appreciate that. I love being an instrument in the hands of the Lord any way that I can, but in all honesty, it is just said by, by God through his prophets. Yeah. And, and, and his, and his leaders. I mean, it was, they do, they teach, they, oh, they teach astounding truth. And that, and don't neglect the book of Mormon, your book of Mormon study and pay attention to the the how time many times covenants is mentioned. And even in the very first preface, when it gives the purpose, we always say that the Jew and Gentile may know that Jesus is a Christ, but it says, and that the covenants of the Lord, that they may know the covenants of the Lord. So it starts with covenants and it ends with covenants. Big okay. stuff. Okay, we're in Enos right now, right? But yeah. I mean, that's where our families, I think we're all there. Okay, we've just finished the gathering of Israel in chapter five of Jacob, right? I mean, and the gathering yeah. of ourselves in Jacob chapter five, but you go to the first book of Enos, and there's only one chapter in Enos. Right off the bat, what does Enos want? He wants to repent, take upon himself the name of Christ, and then he understands the importance of the covenant. You see this, Enos chapter one, verse 16. And I had faith and I did cry unto God that he would preserve the records and he covenanted with me that he would bring them. Why does he want the records? Because the records teach about Abraham and the covenant and Adam and Eve and verse 17. And I, Enos, knew it would be according to the covenant which he had made, wherefore my soul did rest. He, he doesn't rest until the Lord makes a commitment to him that this people are going to have this covenant book. And then you see in verse 27, speaking of the face of God and, and the temple, as you talked about in verse in, in number nine, notice how Enos ends this. And as soon as I go, I soon go to the place of my rest. Rest is a temple word. The people in section 84 with Moses. The Lord. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Entering into the rest of the Lord. The people at the time of Moses lost the ability to enter into the rest of the Lord. Enos is going to the place of my rest. This is sacred. And then, which is with my redeemer, for I know that in him I shall rest. And I rejoice in the day when my mortal shall put on immortality. We are talking temple right now. And shall stand before him. Then I then shall I see his faith. Sorry. Faith too. Then shall I see his face with pleasure, and he will say unto me, Come unto me, ye blessed. There is a place for you in the mansions of my father. That's the end of Enos. We haven't even read the re I mean, that's just today's that is today's reading. It is everywhere in the Book of Mormon. And so we go through these prophets' talks, we go through section 109. It's one eternal round. It's just talking about the same thing over and over and over again. Elaine, for time's sake, maybe. Should we just do 14 and 15 and maybe we have to get together next Monday and talk more about this talk too? Or what do we do, Elaine? I, I actually think for time's sake, that's what we do. And then we get to, we do a, a part two of President Nelson's talk. Okay. We can't shortchange this we can. one. It's too right. important. It's too important. Okay, Elaine, I'm leaving it to you because I've blasted my mouth again. Well, you know, the, I'll read, just read the significance of these keys being returned to the earth by three heavenly messengers can't be overstated, which he has said, and, and, and it really, really can't. But then he goes on to talk about prior to the organization of the church, heavenly messengers had conferred the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood. We've already talked about that um, to Joseph Smith. These keys gave Joseph Smith authority to organize the church. He could not organize the church without that having happened prior. And they appeared on the banks of the Susquehanna they didn't need the temple, but these other, these other keys, the Lord had to have a temple before he could manifest himself. So, okay. So yes. And I will say, sometimes we say the banks of the Susquehanna is if, for anybody who goes to, 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 um, oh my goodness, brain freeze right there. Um, Pennsylvania, Harmony, Pennsylvania. Thank you. Harmony, Pennsylvania. I hope you go there. President Nelson talked about this in his 2019 Spiritual Treasures talk. 
it's up a little bit the hill is up a little bit from Emma Smith's house and there's a cemetery right now. I'm actually going to do a tour this this July and we'll plan on doing I'm I'm sure I'll be doing a tour next next year as well. Maybe I'll do two, but there's one that's already set. But for those of you who want to, for me as a woman, I love going to Harmony, Pennsylvania because that the rest, as President Nelson says, the restoration of the of the priesthood is just as important to women as it is to men. I ho I hope that is so obvious, especially today. I I hope there's no question about how absolutely obvious that is. That site of the Susquehanna River is one of the most sacred sites on the face of the earth. But just up the hill from Emma Smith's home, her family's home, is where the priesthood was, where, the, where Peter James and John came. And today you can go up there. President Nelson just rededicated that area. There's a stake center. And then right behind the stake center in this bush area is the statue of Peter James and John. And you can go there and it's the place that, as far as historians know, is set right there. So just just so you know, that's that's where you can go and you can find the site and they'll have a little plaque that explains that in more detail. But to Elaine's point, that had to happen. Okay. All right. All right. So where where should we where should we end? I think here, fifteen. Barb? Let's do fifteen still, Elaine. I think fourteen was great. So the, then the, in the Kirtland Temple in eighteen thirty six, the conferral of these additional priesthood keys, namely the keys of the gathering of Israel the keys of the gospel of Abraham and the keys of the sealing power was essential. These keys authorized Joseph Smith, big deal, and all succeeding presidents of the Lord's church to gather Israel on both sides of the veil. And I mean, President Nelson is just, I mean, he's giving this, this urgent plea almost you're, and he's talked to the youth, he's talked to the young adults. Your job, the most important job you have, is to gather scattered Israel. And Elaine, uh -huh. we, can't, we can't minimize where he says, on both sides of the veil. Yes. I love yes. that President Nelson, as the prophet says, both sides, he is the prophet of both sides of the veil. I just, and he is calling it family history work like nobody's business. Let's build these temples and save the world. Yes, it is. So it's missionary work obviously that's one side and then it's 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 temple and family history work we were we were born we were saved to be here now yeah to do this work and it's amazing what is happening so then he goes on uh to say uh this is the purpose of this is to bless all covenant children with the blessings of abraham to place a ratifying seal on the priesthood ordinances and covenants and to seal families eternally. The power of these priesthood keys is infinite and breathtaking. Wow, there, that's the place to end right there. Elaine, when, oh, you understand, when the spirit, and I promise you, as you study this, the spirit, if you pray first and study this, the spirit will teach you. And when you really understand what's happening, it is breathtaking. Yeah. I, Elaine, there's so many things that I want to testify of in this. First of all, somebody just said, go to verse 16, which is exactly right. I, but just the first part, I'm not going to go into detail. But because you already did one invitation, this is the last, this is the invitation I think that we leave everyone with today, if that's okay. Consider how your life would be different if priesthood keys had not been restored to the earth. I will just tell you from when he said that, I thought, I don't really want to go there because that is extremely depressing to me. I don't want to consider how my life would be different, but because the prophet said it, I will <laughs> consider how different it is. And it's humbling. And it, for me, it's very depressing. I, I, I am so grateful. I do not know how people lived without the gospel of Jesus Christ. I genuinely, I don't get it. I don't, I'm so grateful that I am alive in 2024 because if I were alive in 1800 or 1700 or 1600, I, I don't know. I, they, I'm sure that the compensatory blessings that the Lord gave to those individuals living at that time, Jonah Bark, one of my all-time favorite people, I, I know that God spoke to people at that time, but I am just so grateful that there is no question in my mind who has priesthood keys and how we are going to live together as a family for eternity. I don't, I don't know. When I, when, you know, almost laughingly talk about the gathering of Israel on both sides of the veil, no, I, like, like the sons of Mosiah and Alma that we're going to be coming to, I cannot stand the idea that we lose one person. I hate it. Like, I want everybody to be in this eternal family. Every single person. I, 
I cannot, my heart does not do well knowing that I may lose someone, anyone, even the stranger down the road. It drives me absolutely batty. So I, I already know how my life would be without, without the priesthood keys because we were told that in Second Nephi, and I've shared this with you before. I can tell you exactly what it would be like for me. Second Nephi chapter nine, our spirits must have become like unto him yeah. and we become devils, angels to a devil to be shut out from the presence of God and to remain with the father of lies and misery like unto himself. So how would my, how would my life be like without priesthood keys? It would be hopeless and it would be living with the father of lies. I can't imagine how horrible a life like that would be. So I, I know. I, I've thought about that actually quite a bit. So that that consideration from President Nelson and that invite is a very strong invite, which is why I think Elaine and you and me and everyone that's on the show, show, whatever this is that we're doing, Instagram Live, I think that's why we're on this together is because we love and care for people and we know this is true and we want people to eat the fruit with us so badly. So anyway, um, I, I will just simply testify as, as I'm leaving, I'm going to give it to you, Elaine. I, I testify that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. I testify that the Book of Mormon is God's book and the scriptures, the Bible, that they are all here for the purpose of testifying. It's another, te every one of them is another testament of Jesus Christ. And these general conferences are another testament of Jesus Christ for the purpose of helping us to receive all of the glory that God has promised us in the pre-mortal world, made possible only through his son, Jesus Christ. And all we need to do is do what he asks. And then use the Savior's atonement when we don't do as well as we could, and then also to help us be better than we are. We could not be saved without Christ helping us overcome, and we could not be saved without him helping us become. So I, I just simply testify, President Nelson is a prophet of God on the earth today. He understands very well the gathering of Israel, the importance of these keys. And, and I, I continue to pray that I can learn more from him and his holy prophets and apostles on the earth. For me, this is a matter of women and men joining together in synergy, being grateful that we have a savior, Jesus Christ, who has been the one who was willing to fulfill the father's plan. I'm just grateful to be alive today and to have this testimony. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And Barbara, thank you to all of you. Barbara, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. And that, that pretty much says it all. And as she was, bearing her testimony, I just will add that I, I, never, I, I know President Nelson is a prophet of God, but watching him at General Conference, just the effort that he puts forth and so many of the brethren put forth just to be there. Uh, these, these men are, are men of God, they're consecrated, they're being renewed, they're being blessed. Um, and I just testify that President Nelson is our prophet for right now. We need to pay attention. And, and next week we'll be talking about the invitations and we need to be, we need to be very diligent about those. I don't want anybody listening to get overwhelmed, but this is overwhelming. And just, we've just got to take it a piece at a time, but we can do this and we can do it together. And I just am so grateful for prophet seers and revelators and for the Old Testament, the New Testament, which testament is another word for covenant. Yes. Old covenant, new covenant, doctrine and covenants, the new and everlasting covenant, the Book of Mormon. I'm so grateful we have those guidance as well. So we have Latter-day prophets and prophets of old, and they're all saying the same thing. And thank you for just being you, Barb. Thank you for being uh, tuning in, everyone, your women your elect women who are seeking the truth and just go through this talk also identifying all the doctrine that President Nelson's taught. This is eternal truth. And I bear you that witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Elaine, once again, for just for the administrative part, anybody you can download these talks for free, please just go to the Instagram page, just download it. And then you can be put on the newsletter for when Elaine and I figure out how we're going to continue to study all these with everyone. And then if you want to buy that already printed out, that's the only place that I know of that's just close enough to us. that may be helpful. It's right off, right off the freeway. So that'll be helpful for you. And then May 3rd, 
I think for me, I, I recognize we're going to do as much as we can on this Instagram live, Elaine, but if there are those that want to come on May 3rd, I'm just going to try to teach all I can in a couple of hours. And then maybe we'll continue to do that in conjunction with this going forward. If that's but okay for everyone. We all, we all thank you, Barb. And, uh, I'm just happy to be a part of this circle of sisters. We're going to, we're going to help each other. We are. As we stay united and as we stay focused on Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Elaine. And I love you so dearly. And I know we were all hanging up, but I just have to say it to Elaine. Elaine, you will know this until I felt this last night as I was saying my prayers. I'm so grateful for your mentorship in my life and your friendship. I, I we're, we're, we're so in this together. We need each other and we need all of you. Yes. We are gathering and gathering is critical today. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Elaine. I love you dearly. Love you too. Bye-bye. And gentlemen. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.